more than most other areas, um, Rabbi Lamb's um, work in a basic philosophical orientation of women in halacha um, impacted me profoundly in the following sense. Um, Rabbi Lamb, uh, although he occasionally addressed specific issues, he provided me with a religious orientation for how to answer questions about the role of play and place of women in Judaism um, without providing um, specific answers to every single question. Sometimes if you develop too idiosyncratic, you answer every question um, without providing any guidance to the next question. And that isn't at all what Rabbi Lamb set out to do here. And I want to try to explain to you my sense of Rabbi Lamb's worldview um, uh, by examining what he wrote about two specific matters and then reflecting on a series of conversations I had with Rabbi Lamb as the rabbi of the young Israel of Toko Hills. Um, and it impacted me intensely and directly um, in how I set out to answer uh, questions that came in front of me. I guess I'll start though, as I have for each of the last six classes with just a little bit of review of Rabbi Lamb and his life and um, his uh, scholarship. Rabbi Lamb was a wonderful scholar. He was the author of many, many, many books and, and um, uh, dozens of articles and 20 books. Um, his last book came out the month before he died called um, Torah Beloved, and it itself is a wonderful book of his collections of his stories about Shavuot. You can buy it on uh, Amazon. Uh, it lists him as uh, still among the living because at the time that the galleys came out, he was. He, um, he was a religious leader, a communal leader, and even more importantly, and we'll see it even more intensely today, Rabbi Lamb was, in the best of the terms, an intellectual compromiser. He was a, a, a religious diplomat who believed in crafting solutions to hard problems that reflected the multiplicity of values that were present in the Jewish tradition and didn't religiously adhere to one view or another. He instead comfortably believed that what really needed to be done here was um, harmonize disparate views and come together with a compromise that um, reasonably reflected all of the different values. And that was a very positive experience and certainly that's exactly what he did here. Um, that's exactly what um, Rabbi Lamb did here. And I want to reflect as follows, because it, it, it impacted me the first time Rabbi Lamb said it. Um, and it oriented me um, in, in what I think are good ways, but even if you think they're bad ways, in the sense of you disagreed with them, you at least acknowledge that um, that Rabbi Lamb provided an orientation. Rabbi Lamb's basic worldview on heightened women's involvement in Judaism was grounded in um, three ideas. And um, these three ideas are what Rabbi Lamb rotated around every time a hard question came up. The first idea that Rabbi Lamb put forward was, is the conduct that women are seeking to do now, but which they historically did not do, a mitzvah? And if the answer is that um, the conduct that's being undertaken is a mitzvah, then Rabbi Lamb was in general very supportive. The second question Rabbi Lamb asked 
was, was there a very, very, very firm tradition on this topic? And if there was a very firm tradition on this topic, um, did we want to engage in compromise to keep the communal, the community whole? Or did we think that this was so important a matter that we were gonna do it our way, even though it raised hackles in one direction or another. And the third thing Rabbi Lamb said, which I think is a corollary to the first two, is changes that neither involved mitzvah um, uh, and violated tradition should generally be frowned on. And that um, Rabbi Lamb thus took the view that the changes that should be done last changes that were untraditional and not driven by religious fervor. Those of you who remember um, my time as the rabbi of the young Israel, you remember how unenthusiastic I was about women dancing with the Torah, and yet how supportive I was about women's Megillah reading. And this is exactly a reflection of Rabbi Lamb's advice to me and his orientation. I thought women dancing with the Torah was not something I was gung-ho enthusiastic about for men, but was the tradition. Um, and I wasn't going to expand the tradition beyond it, um, uh, it since it was uh, not a mitzvah. On the other hand, when it came to women's Megillah reading, I was happy to stake out of an extreme ground um, mostly because the underlining conduct was a mitzvah. And the same thing is true with um, women's uh, marching around with Hoshanas on uh, Yom Tov Davening. Since it is a mitzvah, the fact that there was a tradition not to do this never bothered me. I never spoke to Rabbi Lamb about that specific question, but it was always understood based on my conversations with Rabbi Lamb that his worldview was that you went out of your way to accommodate the desire of women to do mitzvot. And when somebody said that this is untraditional, you responded by saying, that's nice. Um, traditions not to do mitzvot are at their weakest. And in general, we should support everybody's desire to do mitzvot. I want to read to you one of Rabbi Lamb's most radical quotes on this topic. This is from a sermon Rabbi Lamb gave in the early 1970s. And it's such a wonderful quote. I am told, Rabbi Lamb writes, that in Boston, there's a group of young Orthodox students, all girls, who are highly concerned about their role in Judaism have decided to pray every morning while donning tefillin. We have a very strong, now Michael Broyd is talking editorially. We have a very strong tradition that women do not wear tefillin. Rabbi Lamb is quite aware of that fact. Now I go back to reading to you what Rabbi Lamb said. I have no objection to that and would encourage them. There was a time, according to Ramah, that such behavior was frowned upon as euhara or arrogance. But that was different because it was an act of exhibitionism by an individual. However, the case is far different when a whole community of women has decided to accept such a mitzvah. More power to them. I wish that every man would join a minion to lay tefillin. This is a classical example of Rabbi Lamb and his worldview. When confronted with a, a community that's decided it's going to expand the religious opportunities available to women, and they're going to pick an example where there's a very strong tradition that women um, did not do this activity, but they decided as a community exactly the opposite, which is that they were going to do this activity. Rabbi Lamb stepped forward and said, this is good. Good. Um, uh, this is a wonderful idea. And um, 
this wonderful idea should be supported. And Rabbi Lamb parameters the support around the following set of ideas. Um, this is not an individual, and it's not grounded in exhibitionism. This is a community of people seeking religious expression. And Rabbi Lamb thinks that the classical halachic opposition to women putting on tefillin um, is contextualized to a time and a place. And um, when it's discarded on a community level, we should cheer. This is reflective of the following idea that Rabbi Lamb felt very strongly, which I feel very strongly as well. Um, the minhag, not to do mitzvot. When we have a minhag, not to do a mitzvah. Minhag, not to do a good deed. That is the weakest kind of mitzvah. And when a community throws off that, and as a whole, the community agrees that we will start doing this mitzvah again. What we, those of us standing on the sidelines should do is we should cheer them on. We should say more power to them. Rabbi Lamb, I think correctly parameters this in his general way by saying what it takes to do these kinds of changes in public is not a person, but a community. And what it takes to do these kinds of changes is a lack of exhibitionism, but instead a, a sense that um, you're concerned about your relationship with God and Judaism. Again, Rabbi Lamb can, returns to his consistent model about it's focusing on our relationship with God, something we've spoken about many different times in the past in Rabbi Lamb's name. And here he adds to it community. But most importantly, Rabbi Lamb utterly discards 1,600 or 1,800 years of rabbinic tradition um, because Rabbi Lamb thinks that a rabbinic tradition not to do a mitzvah is a weak tradition. We have traditions to do mitzvot. We sometimes have traditions not to do mitzvot, but when we have a tradition not to do a mitzvah and a group of people come along and say, I want to do this mitzvah, we should cheer them on. Um, we shouldn't stand around and say, we have a long-standing tradition not to do this. We should instead scream out as Rabbi Lamb does more power to them. Rabbi Lamb thought and thinks that a general religious idea of we encourage people to do mitzvot needs to be a central idea in the rabbinate. It's hardly the rabbi's job, Rabbi Lamb said to me uh, more than a few different times to tell people to be less observant. Rabbi Lamb thought it took a great deal of rabbinic foresight to imagine that doing mitzvot could lead to harm. So the first thing Rabbi Lamb says, which is very, very, very important, is when I have a tradition not to do a mitzvah, we can live with that. We sometimes have such traditions, but a tradition not to do a mitzvah is weak. And it's easily breached by a community of people who want to return us to the idea of doing a mitzvah. When um, the returning of the blue strings on its sets is treles return to reality, Rabbi Lamb looked around, saw that many people were doing it and said, we should go back to doing this because it's true, we have a thousand year old tradition not to wear treles, but we've changed. And it's a mitzvah to wear treles in your tzitzis and more power to you um, in the wearing of mitzvot in their ideal way. And this was exactly Rabbi Lamb's basic model um, for women in Judaism, which is um, when you pushed him, he said, is this a mitzvah? If this is a mitzvah, 
Um, Rabbi Lamb is supportive. Women wearing tefillin is a mitzvah, and Rabbi Lamb is flat out supportive. Um, he felt the same way very strongly about women learning Torah. Whenever you asked him, he said, women learning Torah is a mitzvah, and we want to be in the business of supporting um, people doing um, mitzvot. He didn't deny that there were times and places where communities developed the custom of discouraging men and women from doing occasional mitzvot. And Rabbi Lamb understood these as um, temporary things that communities did because of the needs of the times. And when the community reached a decision not to do a mitzvah, it was immodest. Rabbi Lamb thought to publicly defy the community and do this mitzvah. It made you appear, as Rabbi Lamb once said to me, frummer than the Pope. And that's not a good thing to feel. It's just an important idea, which is that um, when we live in a community where the community has decided we don't as a whole do this mitzvah, Rabbi Lamb was happy to live with that. But when the community changed its mind and decided on the whole as a community it wanted to do the mitzvah, Rabbi Lamb thought that we should encourage people to do mitzvot and we should encourage men to do mitzvot, we should encourage um, women to do mitzvot. Um, and when, when people want to make change in a public way, in order to make sure it wasn't what Rabbi Lamb calls exhibitionism, yuhara, uh, we said the change should take place on a communal level. Anytime you spoke to Rabbi Lamb about doing mitzvot in private, Rabbi Lamb said everybody should be encouraged to do mitzvot in private, since in private um, there is no uh, fear of um, of um, Exhibition. exhibitionism, of yura, of people doing mitzvot to one up each other, um, one way or another. Are and there this is an important idea? Yes, please. Uh, are there mitzvot which are clearly geared towards men and just preclude? the introduction of women, even if they want to. I mean, that are... are... Sure, circumcision. Yeah, right, right. Okay, but mm -hmm. we're not talking about mitzvot that are biologically right. precluded. Right. But Rabbi Lamb's basic point goes as follows. Communities develop standards. And sometimes the communal standard is low, out of necessity. And when somebody says, I want to keep a higher standard than the communal norm, Rabbi Lamb thought that that was something you did in private, and it wasn't something that you did in public, because doing something like that in public rather than in private um, created a sense of immodesty. Rabbi Lamb wasn't in favor of people keeping longer Shabbos than the posted times. He wasn't against making the posted times longer. He thought that was a communal decision. But if you wanted to keep a longer Shabbos than everybody else, um, you should do so in a very quiet and discreet way. He thought that if you wanted to put on Rabbeinu Tam Tefillin, you should do so um, in the privacy of your home when nobody was looking and not in front of everybody else as a way of saying, yeah, 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 I'm from her than you. But when a whole community decides to evolve, um, and they want to evolve in a way that makes them more religious, Rabbi Lamb thought that we should all be supportive of that uh, greater religiosity. Um, I always found that to be a very reasonable way um, to think about all sorts of questions um, that um, that have popped up since Rabbi Lamb, um, you know, that popped up since the 1950s. So when you went to Rabbi Lamb and said that I'm a woman and I want to learn to be a shochet, Rabbi Lamb said, good, let's start a shochet program for women and let's see if we can get 50 women into such a program or 15 women into such a program. And when it turns out that there was no such interest and it was just one person, Rabbi Lamb said, better not to do that. Because when you're all by yourself, people will think that this is immodest. Whereas when you start a 
a daf yomi, Rabbi Lamb thought you'll start on a daf yomi and women will attend and there'll be many women attending and it won't have any appearance um, of immodesty. Um, on the other hand, when you went to Rabbi Lamb and said, I wish to engage in conduct that generated a sense of religious gender equality, but the religious gender equality was not an undergirding of a mitzvah, but just an undergirded sense of religious equality. So Rabbi Lamb thought that um, that wasn't an obvious virtue. And since that wasn't an obvious virtue, um, he thought you how to counterbalance that with the controversy that it was likely to cause and the pulling at the communal fabric of orthodoxy. And Rabbi Lamb, in that sense, thought that there was a difference between short-term change and long-term change. And this is another very important observation Rabbi Lamb made that I liked very much. When somebody asked Rabbi Lamb about women rabbis, Rabbi Lamb said something very interesting. And those of you who know, know I wrote extensively on this topic uh, adopting Rabbi Lamb's basic model. Rabbi Lamb said as follows, I'm going to read the paragraph to you and maybe we'll parse it a little bit. There are certain things that are, that are acceptable, on, this is Rabbi Lamb speaking, there are certain things that are acceptable only in the raw long run. I approve of the idea of increasing the role of women in religious life and think it is an important one. Here, Rabbi Lamb articulates the idea of what I call incremental change. Good ideas sometimes are tested over an extended period of time and not implemented in one fell swoop. Um, and increasing the role of women in religious life is an important one. Just imagine, Rabbi Lamb continues, we have taken women who have good brains, good character, and good personalities and devoted their lives to Hitler's three Ks, Kinder, Kutch, and Kirsch, children, kitchen, and church. Women are not just good for these three things. There are enough individual cases that are exceptions to allow you to learn a min haprat ala from the specific case to the general category. It is just not true that they, women, cannot think straight. They can. We have crooked ideas if we think otherwise. So the first thing Rabbi Lamb says is, I'll put it in my terms, which Rabbi Lamb didn't quite put it in. Enlightenment has shown us that um, as women move into education, they're just as educatable as men, meaning some women are very educatable, some women are moderately educatable, and some women are, are very hard to educate, just like men. some men fit into the same category. Some men are very educatable, some women, men are moderately educatable, and some men you're just wasting your time on. And it's silly to think that there are profound intellectual differences between men and women. To have a woman learn Gemara, Rabbi Lamb continues, a generation or two ago, like women learn Gemara today, would have been too revolutionary. But with time, things change. Time answers a lot of questions, erodes discomfort, and helps. Here, Rabbi Lamb is saying something that I think is also very important. The passage of time when we deal with activity that is essentially permissible, um, but traditionally not done, encounters a culture of change. And the culture of change naturally makes people scared. And there's a group out there which is afraid that if we make this change, um, too much will change too fast, and um, that'll lead to a bad place, to which Rabbi Lamb says, I hear you, could be. And the correct response um, is um, that you should do so gradually and incrementally. 
and see over time if the gradual incrementalism reduces people's um, discomfort. And I don't think he meant it in exactly the same way um, that you or I mean. And I think Rabbi Lamb meant as follows. The costs of schism, of people being very dis uncomfortable with the way we are, is um, too high. And um, we need to go slow to get rid of this discomfort. So my answer when I was asked by a reporter about what I think about women rabbis was basically, it's going too fast. I did not say it was wrong. This is Rabbi Lamb speaking. I did not say it was right. It, was, it just has not paced itself properly. I was criticized, Rabbi Lamb said, of course. People asked me, you mean that I'll be in there not there allowed to become rabbis? My response, I don't know. Are you sure they're not allowed? Rabbi Lamb here reflects very much um, Rabbi Lamb's sense of um, how to handle religious innovation. The topic started to get addressed about women rabbis. Um, the rabbinate is unlike uh, many other aspects of learning in the sense that it's not exactly a topic discussed in the Talmud. Our modern rabbinate is a modern invention. And the smicha that we have comes distinctly from the 14 or 1500s and not much uh, later than that and not much earlier than that. And Rabbi Lamb, when confronted by it, said as follows, look, I don't really know if this is permissible um, or prohibited, um, but I do know um, that it's too fast. Um, and this too fast um, reflects the fact that Rabbi Lamb um, was afraid of um, schism. Um, and Rabbi Lamb thought that the fight over activity that was essentially neither required by Jewish law nor opposed to by Jewish law was go slow, go slow. Right. Um, from Rabbi Lamb's comment here, I, I wrote an article about women rabbis where I adopted a metaphor that's been widely copied since I had said it. I said, um, some aspects of Orthodox Judaism are like orthodontia, which is um, the way you move teeth is slowly and over an extended period of time, and you don't move teeth quickly with large amounts of force, that breaks teeth. Um, that doesn't move teeth, that breaks teeth. And Rabbi Lamb's point here is as follows. Um, the pace of change when I'm dealing with activity that is not a mitzvah is important and very much determined by sociology and community. You want to contrast Rabbi Lamb on women rabbis and Rabbi Lamb on tefillin. The contrast is that Rabbi Lamb thinks the wearing of tefillin is a mitzvah. And when you say to somebody, should we stop people from doing a mitzvah? Rabbi Lamb says, that's just not our place. Our business, our job is to encourage people to do mitzvot. It's not to discourage people from doing mitzvot. And all attempts to limit people doing mitzvot needs to be constricted and restrained. Um, it's just not who we are to tell people, please stop doing that mitzvah. And when you're doing that mitzvah offends my religious sensibilities, it's I who need to outgrow my religious sensibilities. On the other hand, when I deal with activity that is at its core social and not at its core religious, um, 
And in that situation, Rabbi Lamb is comfortable saying, you know what we need to do? We need to go slowly and be careful and be aware of um, people's feelings and ponder how people think about hard issues because we're not dealing here at its core with a mitzvah. We're dealing here at, our, at its core with a social conversation about successful leadership. Um, I have always understood this to be a crystal clear rule. And it's a crystal clear rule um, that I would like to see move more intensely into the Orthodox community. Um, it goes as follows. Um, everybody who seeks to do a mitzvah that others, that we've historically not encouraged people to do, should be supported in the doing of this mitzvah. And when whole communities evolve and start doing mitzvot that they generally didn't do, uh, we want to be supportive of whole community religious change in a positive way. That's what we want. We want people more mitzvot. And when we see people doing more mitzvot, um, we want to say, um, go for it and do more mitzvot. On the other hand, when we encounter people instituting social change, um, and when I look around and I see to myself, is this a mitzvah? The answer is no. Um, then um, we need to go much more slowly and examine the religious consequences of change. So to me, this has always produced a stark social dichotomy, which is I'm a vast supporter of women's Megillah reading, and I'm a vast unsupporter of women's Torah reading. I think that women's Torah reading is not a positive idea because we don't construct it as a minion and we don't call it tefillah b'tzibor and you don't fulfill the mitzvah of Torah reading. It's a charade that doesn't in fact accomplish the mitzvah of Torah reading in public. Women who leave Torah reading in a minion to go to a Torah reading outside a minion have sacrificed the mitzvah of hearing Torah reading um, to do a non-mitzvah. On the other hand, a woman who reads Megillah has fulfilled the mitzvah of Megillah reading in the best of ways, which is mitzvah bo yoser mishlucho. It's better for her to read Megillah. And the people who listen to her um, are also fulfilling the mitzvah of Megillah no different than if they heard it from a man. And so I'm a vast supporter of the mitzvah of Megillah reading by women, and I'm a silent critic. You don't go around screaming out, because I'm generally not a screamer, but I'm not a comfortable supporter of women's Torah reading because it doesn't fulfill the mitzvah. Since it doesn't fulfill the mitzvah, um, I'm not in favor of it. If I thought women getting aliyot at a minion of men was halachically proper, I would be a supporter of that because that is a fulfillment of the mitzvah. I have technical objections to that that I put in writing elsewhere, what they call a partnership minion, which is not a topic for today. But Rabbi Lamb's point here is very, very important. Um, it provides you with a path forward and a way to think about questions um, that aren't asked, but will be asked in the future. Every time a person comes forward and says, I want to do something that by tradition, people like me didn't do. So I ask myself, is this person asking for an opportunity to do a mitzvah that they were historically deprived of doing? in which case I want to be as supportive as I can and publicly supportive if this is a community making this request? Or is this a person seeking an opportunity to do an activity that really in its heart is not a mitzvah? In which case I very much want to examine the social conversation around me to determine will this on the whole um, be a positive thing? I don't have to knee jerk a yes response or a no response, I have to instead 
closely examine the social consequences of this activity. And sometimes I answer that question in, in the way Rabbi Lamb did about women rabbis by saying, go slow and make baby steps and see over time what works and advance um, when it's prudent to advance and retreat when it's prudent to retreat and recognize that the stakes are not God's commandments, but the social construct of the community. And the social construct of the community needs to be shaped by the social reality around me. And it isn't driven exactly by um, a halachic construct of am I doing a mitzvah or am I not doing a mitzvah? And this is the way I think Rabbi Lamb um, contributed enormously to the discourse of the role of women in Judaism. Rabbi Lamb provided a framework for answering every single question that will ever arise from now to eternity on this topic. And even though he didn't answer these questions, um, he, he provided a framework for thinking about all of these questions. Um, Rabbi Lamb expressed reservation and hesitation regarding the future. And he thought that the pace of change was essential to achieving positive social, whatever that might be. And he recognized that when I had a Mina Yisrael, like we've had a long Mina Yisrael that women weren't rabbis, Rabbi Lamb thought that you didn't just poop down, plop down and change that Mina Yisrael at the drop of a hat, even though you could state a claim for doing so. He thought that since it was neither a mitz or an avera, it was just a fine social change if you thought it was, and a bad social change if you thought it wasn't, um, you had to go slowly and closely examine um, whether the changes that we were making were positive socially. But this wasn't the same process he wanted to use when women came forward and requested changes that he thought they could make a bracha on. When you came forward and said, um, can I make a bracha on this? Is this a mitzvah? Rabbi Lamb um, said, if this is a mitzvah, then we need to say to them more power to them and wholeheartedly endorse the desire of women to expand the mitzvah opportunities. Rabbi Lamb's point is, is that the Ashkenazi custom is very strongly that um, we encourage people who are not obligated in mitzvot to do them anyway. And that we think that mitzvot are intrinsically good and that when you want to do a mitzvah in private that nobody else like you is doing, we say, okay. And when a whole community wants to start doing that mitzvah in public, um, we should say more power to you. We want more people and more communities to do mitzvot. Um, and um, we don't want um, that sort of we don't want to be in the business of discouraging people from doing mitzvot. But when you come forward with a suggestion <coughs> to start doing something that one group has not historically done, um, then um, um, then you have to be a little more careful. Um, Rabbi Lynn didn't directly discuss the question of motivation. Neely asked, did Rabbi Lamb uh, ask questions about motivation? And the answer goes as follows. Rabbi Lamb parametered this conversation so as to avoid serious conversation about motives because Rabbi Lamb said as follows. If you're doing them in private, your motive has got to be sincere because nobody's cheering you on. So when you went to Rabbi Lamb and said, I'm a woman and I want to put on tefillin every day in private out of the sincere sense of religious worship, Rabbi Lamb said in private, that's okay. And when you went to Rabbi Lamb and said, our whole community, all 500 of us 
want to start putting on tefillin every day, Rabbi Lamb said, there's no questioning the motives of hundreds of people who want to do mitzvot. He didn't think um, that it was appropriate um, to question the motives of a community, and he didn't think it was necessary to question the motives of people in private. So I've always found this model of Rabbi Lamb to be profound. He didn't apply it publicly in hundreds of cases. Um, every time I called him to discuss a case, this is the framework he applied to me, and then he encouraged me to apply it, and I don't think I'm the only person who thought this. This model, which distinguishes between mitzvah activity and non-mitzvah activity, and only looks at the social consequences and the rate of change for non-mitzvah activities, remains Rabbi Lamb's enduring contribution um, to the proper role and place of expanding women's opportunities in mitzvot. He sought to expand everybody's opportunity um, to do mitzvot. Individuals can do mitzvot that they traditionally didn't do in private, and communities could expand the opportunities available for women to do mitzvot in public um, so long as it was undertaken as a communal activity of the whole. Um, I thought that Rabbi Lamb here said something very important and um, contributed a framework for analyzing a problem that really until Rabbi Lamb analyzed it, um, tended to have piecemeal analysis, which is yes here, no there. But when you ask, is there a consistent principle and what is that consistent principle, you got hemming and hawing. And Rabbi Lamb was not a hammer of horror, he was an analytic person, and he favored um, this kind of analysis. Would Rabbi Lamb hence have encouraged people to go up to the Har Habayit? I don't know, you have to decide if going up to the Har Habayit is a mitzvah or an avera. If it's a mitzvah, he would have encouraged it, and if it was an avera, he would have discouraged it. You have to first figure it out, the Har Habayit is very interesting because there's a group of halachic authorities led by Rabbi Herzog who say going up to the Harabayat is a sin. And then there's a group right. of halachic authorities led by Rabbi Mordechai Elio that say it's a mitzvah. You have to answer that question first. I have a question. Uh, so what, you know, once you've let the cat out of the bag with these, you know, baby steps of whatever, how do you ever go back if you decide that maybe it's not quite right? sociologically? Uh, I don't know. I think that's well, the reason why Rabbi Lamb advocated slow on social questions is because he thought it was very hard to stick the cat back in the bag on social questions, and thus he went very slow. On religious questions, I think he never wanted to stick the cat back in the bag, but on social questions, I think he was terribly afraid, and that's why he advocated slow go on social questions, because he thought there was no sticking the cat back in the bag. You're right. You're but even right. when you're slow, it's still, you've taken a step. Oh, that's bad. Can you go back? I don't know. Never address that question. I admit to you, it's a challenging question. But sometimes the risks of doing nothing are just as dangerous as the risks of doing something. So I think Sam would say you have to go with, as the Supreme Court says, um, with all due speed, with a prudent cautiousness. I look forward to seeing you on our eighth class about Rabbi Lamb.